Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Mars. Today we look at conspiracy theories. There seem to be more of them now than ever, and many people buy into the notion that the Sandy Hook school shootings were faked, that the former president is not American, that Tom Hanks is a pedophile. We're going to take a closer look at the psychology behind conspiracy theories on today's program. Joining me in studio is Dr. Alan Lambert, Associate Professor of Psychology at Washington University. Thank you so much for being with us. Great to be here, Don. Thanks. I think to get this started, we'll have to define conspiracy theory. What the heck is a conspiracy theory? Oh, gosh, now, that's a great question. I uh, should mention a lot of scholars have studied that. There's, not, there's less agreement than you, than you might think. Mm-hmm. Um, usually conspiracy theories have to do with assumptions about a vast, powerful entity, usually secret, um, that's covering up, uh, obviously, the truth, in many cases, and they're notable in that they seem to be pushing it back against the conventional wisdom um, you know, in the media and whatnot. Um, yep. Are certain people more susceptible to them than others? That's a great question. This has actually been a topic of uh, research for decades. Um, I can tell you what's um, not true of conspiracy theories. It has nothing to do with intelligence. There's no specific link to whether people are uh, high or low intelligence. Um, it's actually not a product of being on the political right or left. Um, what research does suggest is that people at the political extremes are more likely to um, hold conspiracy theories. One old theory is that uh, people who are high in paranoia uh, mm-hmm. were more likely to believe these theories. Turns out that's not true. The best predictor of, of conspiracy theories is whether they believe in other conspiracy theories. Mm-hmm. Um, And that's actually by far the strongest effect. One of the, uh, it's not a definition exactly, but an explanation is that it uh, it is a means of coping with complexity. Does that sound right? Um, I've read that description. I agree in part with that, but partly not. In one sense, that's true is that a lot of events in real life are complex. And conspiracy theories often try to reduce that into a a few simple assumptions, on the other hand, conspiracy theories often require absurdly complex uh, assumptions. For example, uh, one conspiracy theory is that the moon landing was, was faked. Mm-hmm. And if that's true, then that requires the assumption that thousands of um, employees at NASA have been bribed to keep quiet. And that's not a very parsimonious theory. or It requires a lot of mm-hmm. assumptions that's almost certainly not correct. On the other hand, you take something like the assassination of John Kennedy. Mm-hmm. There's enough plausibility, I guess, in that discussion to make people really think there was a conspiracy. Yeah, that's a great example. Mm-hmm. I think you can think of uh, conspiracy theories on a continuum of uh, theories that are just certainly false. You know, the, for example, the world, the world actually is round. It's not flat. Mm-hmm. The JFK conspiracy theories... You know, it took many years for people to sort of arrive at a conclusion, and, and there's some grain of truth to some of those conspiracy mm-hmm. theories, but that's a good example where uh, that's not as extreme, for example, as the Sandy Hook conspiracy theory, which yeah. is clearly false. Clearly false, and yet it is out there, and there are people who who buy into it. What What about motives for mm. people who, I mean, they have to start someplace. Right. And with our friend Alex Jones, I guess, is, is, is one that uh, is focusing on some of these things. Uh, what about motives? It's, a, it's another great question. It's, it's also, that's also been a um, top, topic of research for decades. The way I like to think of it is part of a larger dynamic of in-group and out-groups. People have a need to see their own in-group as validated, as correct, and a need to see the other group as um, having a bogus view of reality. So the way I like to think of it is it's not necessarily the content of the conspiracy theory. It, the underlying motive would be to um, for people to see themselves as part of the privileged few who have a view of the world as it really is, which instantly, of course, creates two groups, believers and non-believers. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say that content is important, but I think there's – I think you're onto something here, that there's a dynamic, a, a need to see one's own self, the group, as a privilege, part of the privileged few. One of those that's out there right now, and I have my own conspiracy theory, which I'll give to you in a moment for your evaluation. One that's out there now is focusing on Tom Hanks, saying that Tom Hanks, the actor, 
who is very, very popular, I think, uh, you know, more so than many uh, in his profession, that he is a pedophile. Where in the world might something like that come from and why? Gosh, um, you know, I've been reviewing all sorts of um, conspiracy theories. I, I saw that one in passing. Uh, I guess the simple answer is I, I have no idea. I could give some guesses that this might be driven by, for whatever reason, they see Tom Hanks as part of the liberal elite and they wanted – there's an underlying motive to, to quote-unquote, bring him down. Um, and that's, of course, another aspect of conspiracy theories. They're very viral. They're, they're typically very interesting um, they spread very quickly, and uh, that could be one explanation for that. Yeah. Well, th- this is my theory, and uh, I'm certainly not an expert, but it seems that some of them are really designed to undermine our institutions. And by taking on someone like Tom Hanks, as mm-hmm. you say, he represents a point of view, and they want to bring that down as well. Isn't that a possibility? Yes. I, I think that's a general um, – that's generally true of conspiracy theories. It's designed to, to quote, unquote, take down the establishment and whatever the establishment would be. It could be the government. It could be the opposing political party. It could be a disliked media outlet. It, it's – I think one good way of looking at this, it's an attempt to invalidate a person mm-hmm. or a group, uh, to associate them with some sort of nefarious um, uh, motive – um, and that's actually a common theme of most, if not all, of conspiracy theories. And the means of doing that today is much different than it was just a few years ago, thanks to uh, the Internet. Yeah, that's – I mean, one question I've been getting a lot lately is whether conspiracy theories are more uh, common these days. And I think they're more common, but they're, they spread much, much more quickly now because of the Internet. We mm-hmm. hear about them faster. Are they sometimes true? Well, you know, I need to be careful here. Um, Almost all conspiracy theories are false. There are some disturbing historical examples of conspiracy theories that turned out to be true. Um, For example, the so-called MKUltra conspiracy theory, the belief that the government was uh, administering LSD and other um, drugs to um, college students and servicemen. This is all out in the open. The CIA uh, admits this. Um, This is a church committee report in the 19, I think 1975, and they basically said, yes, this, this was going on for a number of years. It was terminated in the early 70s. But, you know, if you and I were talking, say, in the 1960s, um, if I said, well, the government's been engaging in this, that would sound a lot like a conspiracy theory. And that mm-hmm. turns out to be true. Now, the danger is when people say, well, that, that, that theory is true, then most of the other theories must be true either. Of course, mm-hmm. that's, that's a slippery slope that we don't want to go down. I mentioned uh, Al- Alex Jones a, m- a moment ago, and, and uh, he has, um, has uh, broadcast a, a number of these theories. What do you make of someone like this? And this organization that's popped up more recently, Kanan, I guess is the way it's uh, is yeah. pronounced. Uh, it's very, very active, and I mean, they even have uniforms for crying out loud. Yeah. You know, I, I was talking to you before the show, and, you know, I... Um, I did make an effort. I did watch a video that he made on his own website to try to figure out what he was saying. To be honest, it's it's not clear what he was saying. Um, p- uh, part of me wanted uh, seemed like he was actually believing the Sandy Hook conspiracy theory, the the the, the other one you mentioned. Uh, another part of me thinks he's doing it as a publicity stunt. Mm-hmm. Um, but he seems to enjoy spreading these these theories. Um, that's for sure. Um, well, is the getting to the, the psychology of this in terms of what it is doing to the rest of us who see these things and mm-hmm. have to kind of wade through them and, and sort them out? Well, I think one good way of looking at this is that what conspiracy theories are really good at is instantly dividing people into two camps, the mm-hmm. believers and the non-believers. And I see that as a larger dynamic of, of in-groups and out-groups. So one way of looking at conspiracy theories, it's not so much what they are, but what they do. And they, they, they're very good at splitting people into camps. Um, and my colleagues asked me, well, is there a way of uh, convincing people that conspiracy theories are false? But I'm sure as many of your listeners know, the more you try to convince somebody that some things, uh, that their beliefs are not true, the more they will push back. How, how should we cope with them? Well, I mean, that's, that's a great question. I would say one way of coping with this is that um, first to recognize that not all the beliefs that we hold are perfectly validated or grounded mm-hmm. in fact. Um, 
one thing that I do actually is that I'm politically liberal, and um, but I find it useful to look at other more right-leaning news sources to see what they're saying about various issues. Um, but as far as a hardcore conspiracy theorist to uh, try to convince him or her that their theories are, are false, I don't know. That's a hard sell because it's what psychologists call a, um, a closed system, that the more information that you give them suggesting that their theories are, are, are suspect, the more this can feed into their uh, belief that, in fact, their conspiracy theories are true. We talk a lot on this program about media literacy and the idea to really explore uh, some of these things. Just uh, don't take anything at face value, but find a way to do some research. Yeah. I mean, yeah, obviously, I think that's a great approach. Of course, that can be taken too far. That um, you know something, if, you know, if you hear about some sort of event, some events are clearly true. We don't need to double check everything. Yeah. But I guess the uh, the danger is that we assume that certain things are are absolutely true, and then we don't we don't follow up on them because mm-hmm. what people tend to do is self select themselves into watching various news sources. Um, by and large, liberals tend to have their preferred outlets, and the same is true of the political right. Um, but it's always good to ask yourself. Hmm, what is the uh, factual basis for for my beliefs? Are we seeing, given today's political environment, uh, are we seeing more of these things today? And given the fact the internet is is out there and available, are we seeing more today than was the case? You know, and I, I don't think we're actually seeing more conspiracy theories in the sense that they are more common. I think it is true we're hearing about them more, mm-hmm. and I think there, admittedly, there's part of uh, certain aspects of this political climate. Um, are are conducive to conspiracy theories, but in a literal sense, I don't think that uh, in this that conspiracy theories have all of a sudden become more common. Mm-hmm. I, I think we're hearing about them more. Just before you came into the studio today, I saw something online from CNN, basically saying that the the latest theory is that our our president is not the way we see him on television, that he's quite different, that this is an act. He is uh, doing what he does that we're all familiar with in terms of the way he approaches rallies, the way he talks to people and talks about people is not the real Donald Trump, that some of these tapes that are surfacing today show him to be very measured, very articulate, very smart, and a totally different kind of persona that we're familiar with day to day. Yeah. I mean, that's... um that's sort of turning everything sort of on its head. So people are getting, some people, a lot of people are getting mad at Donald Trump, and then sort of this theory is saying, well, he's really not like that at all, um, which sort of feeds into this uh, uncertainty as what is, what is truth mm-hmm. and what what is not truth. So it's, um, I hadn't heard of that one before, but well, it's uh, brand new. It's, yes. sort of, it's breaking news today. I don't know if it's fake news or not, but it's bra- <laughs> it is breaking news. Uh, Well, we'll come back and talk more about conspiracy and conspiracy theaters, uh, theories, that is, uh, and we'll do so hopefully with you. If you have questions that you'd like to ask the professor, please give us a call at 382-8255. That's 382-TALK, or send us a tweet at STL on air. We'd like to know what you think about these theories, and perhaps you know of some that we haven't even heard of yet. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening to this St. Louis on the Air podcast supported by University College at Washington University with undergraduate and graduate programs part-time evening and online. University College at Washington University offering world-class education within reach. Welcome back to our conversation about conspiracy theories. Uh, w- one of the issues I guess we would try to connect in this environment of, of conspiracy theories is the association with fake news. Do, can we put the two of them together? Are the dots that connect the two? Sure. Yeah, I think there's a clear connection there. So from the perspective of, of, of a given person, um, when they use the term fake news, as opposed to another way of framing that, they're seeing news which is promoting a false narrative. Mm-hmm. Um We'll say I think there's a matter of degree here. I think when people make uh, accusations of false news, I don't think this necessarily has to do with a conspiracy theory, but I would say the underlying dynamic is not dissimilar. It's, it's, we go back to what we talked about before the break. It's a, it's a question of legitimacy yeah. or an attempt to invalidate a certain um, – invalidate the other's perspective and validate your own 
worldview. Yeah, Th this takes me back to the, the issue of motive, which is something that fascinates me. Again, because they have to start someplace, mm. somebody, some individual said, I think I'll put this out there. The question is, why? I thought about that, and I think there's, there's several answers to that. I think one answer is that not all conspiracy theories, but many have a grain of truth to them. The people will find some sort of a factoid or some evidence, and then they will seize on that. Now, why, oh, for example, the um, so-called fake moon landings, there are videos out there, you can look them up in the vi on the Internet, of um, um, films that were made in studios of practice um, among the astronauts. Now, why somebody would seize on that and then use that as a basis to claim that the actual moon landing in 1969 was faked, that's a hard question. I would say part of it is people um, have a need to see themselves as promoting the truth, and conspiracy theories are nothing if not attention grabbing. Mm -hmm. So one way of looking at this, I suppose, is to people want to be seen as important as, as conveying a message and embracing a particularly um, crazy or nutty idea is, is a good way of doing that. Yeah. And yet you look at things like the, the contention that the 9-11 uh, attacks on the World Trade Center were done by the government yeah. and that there is a deep state out there somewhere that someone is pulling the strings and and manipulating government, that would seem to suggest that somebody's, again, trying to undermine our institutions. Yeah. I mean, the 9-11 the conspiracy theories, those are interesting and disturbing in a number of ways. I mean, for one thing, some surveys have suggested that something around 40 to 50 percent of the population believes that the government's withholding some sort of information. Mm -hmm. Now, whether those are full-fledged conspiracy theories is hard to say, but you know, I, I think the 9-11 conspiracy theories are a good example because that's not, statistically speaking, can't be dismissed as, as, a, as a slice of the universe in terms of number of people. There are a lot of people out there who yeah. embrace that. Um, and again, uh, social psychologists are good at, uh, at certain things, and I think on this count, um, we don't have a great answer to the motive and a uh, question because it, there are probably different motives going on to some extent for each conspiracy. But the bottom line is ultimately that's what they are accomplishing of yeah, probably to, to a large degree. Uh, let's start taking some calls. We'll begin with Jack, who's calling from Baldwin. Jack, thanks for waiting. You're on the air. Uh, hi. Um, thanks for taking my call. Um, I'd just like to push back against some of the things about Alex Jones. Um, so I first started hearing about Alex Jones uh, during the past presidential election. Like his, some of news articles from his website started showing up. Um, you know, basically they were, it was about like uh, covering like underreported crimes like committed by ISIS in like uh, Europe, um, things like that. And he was one of the few uh, to also cover the um, President Trump, you know, when nobody gave him a chance. So that's how I started, uh, you know, finding out about Alex Jones. So I had never heard about this, like, Sandy Hook conspiracy theories or 9-11 conspiracy theories until it was brought up by the media. And that's only that's the only thing they say about Alex Jones. Like, oh, that's the Sandy Hook guy. When if you started following him from even, like, two years ago, you might, ne you might never know that. So I think it's like a narrative that's being constructed around Alex Jones. It's like saying, like, well, because CBS made this... Um, uh, a while ago, when Dan Rather, uh, he found, he said he found um, uh, Bush's military records, but it turned out it was just fake. It was uh, made in Microsoft Word. It's like saying, well, CBS should be like, taken off the air because of that. You know, I think maybe Alex Jones, back, back in the beginning, a couple, you know, several years ago, he's, uh, he had his own radio station that was making, like, you know, conspiracy theories, um, you know, just for fun or something. But I, I think he's been, like, transitioning to, like, something else. And, you know, I think there's an interest, you know, I, I feel like, you know, why are you, um, why are they kind of focusing on Alex Jones now and, and, and bringing up old stuff? It's okay. Like Jack, we, we've brought up the idea, uh, and, and time's getting away. I think we have the idea. Uh, Alan, you want to respond to that? Well, I, I do see what the caller is saying. From, uh, I actually did listen to a video of Alex Jones and, from his perspective, he's saying, well, I'm covering the stories that other media outlets aren't covering. Um, I think the, people, the thing that people are upset about is that if you actually look at what he said, he has said that uh, Sandy Hook never happened, and, and understandably that's what's got people upset. Um, 
I think the caller is saying, well, here's a guy that's that's covering stories that other people aren't covering. I, I think that's true. Uh, but that's not what people are upset about. They're upset about the Sandy Hook, um, sure. and he's on record as, as, as denying mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, thank Jack for the call. Uh, one of our regular listeners, Madonna, calls from Crestwood, has a question, says, uh, is there any tie between the religiosity or evangelical leanings of a person and their propensity to more readily believe conspiracy theories? Uh, that's been researched a lot, and the answer is no. There's no, when you look at the all the data, there's no propensity for certain religious groups to believe in certain conspiracy theories over others. I mean, you could cherry pick and say, well, what about this? But if you look at all the data, um, there's no um, strong connection between religiosity and, and Consp- uh, conspiracy theories. What, what about uh, conspiracy theories concerning religion? Oh, sure. I mean, as many of your listeners know, there's been a long history of uh, conspiracy theories that the the Jews are con- controlling the you know society and the government. Um, that's the one that occurs to me first. But um, you know, there's conspiracy theories about other religions as well. It's certainly not only about the uh, Jewish religion. Um, it's you, you usually find it, uh, conspiracy theories will go against any other group that you oppose. It could be a religious group, a political group, or um, it's, it's just two examples. All right. Let's take another call. Jack will join us from St. Louis. You're on the air, Jack. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you. You talk about motive. I think one big one out there that's not being looked at real carefully could be part of Alec Jones' motive is money. As uh, you guys mentioned, this is very attention-grabbing stuff. Another motive, I understand, it, is uh, the theory that Kennedy was uh, killed through a CIA conspiracy. I understand, according to a Daily Beast article a couple of years ago, that was uh, probably planted by the Soviets. So those are two, two motives that, uh, that I think uh, are uh, behind some of these theories. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm not a JFK expert, um, but I would say... Um, that's an example of a theory. I mean, that's been around, of course, since 1963, the, the, those theories. And uh, I've, we could probably, if we had more time, list a dozen or so poss- potential motives um, on that one. But again, it, I think it's hard to, tr- to pin down any given motive for any given conspiracy theory. There are probably lots of different motives. Although it's probably one constant is that people, of course, want attention and they want validation that their view is correct. I know that sounds like a cop-out, but I think that's actually a, um, probably one of the um, strongest commonalities. We thank Jack for the call. We have a, a, a Twitter uh, writer here, L, I believe is the name. Uh, this is a somewhat lengthy. A good friend has been talking to me about the intersection of chemtrails, 5G technology, and Morgellons. She's an attorney, very bright, extremely well-read. She can out-argue me on these topics. She wants advice. And then she adds, I've read some of her evidence, which includes over a 1,000 patents on the technology involved, and I find myself sympathetic to her point of view at times. Weather modification is not new, and we know the government sprayed poor areas in St. Louis in the 60s. How do we know what the label of conspiracy theories isn't, and that it isn't an attempt to discredit what is actually happening? Um, yeah, that's a great example. So one popular conspiracy theory is that those chemtrails, um, plumes that you find behind uh, planes, that the government is using those to to poison people. Um, That's obviously false. Uh, Now, it is true that over history, the government has engaged in experiments with weather. Um, I'm sure we could dig out some of those with more time. Uh, but that's sort of this grain of truth idea that the thing, well, the government's con- conducted secret experiments on the weather in other respects, so the, the, um, these um, contrails must be uh, part of a government plot. So, of course, a, uh, one does not lead to the other in terms of logic. And, and when there is a very logical physical explanation from what's actually, <laughs> what's actually going on. I think that, it's water vapor. I yeah, think exactly it's, right. Uh, let's bring in Nick calling from St. Peter's. Nick, thanks for waiting. You're on the air. Problem. Um, yeah, I enjoy the topic today. I listen to you guys all the time. I've uh, kind of been involved in some of these conspiracy theories, you know, for the past 15 years. I think what led me into it was starting to understand the fractal lending system, how the Federal Reserve System works, and trying to, you know, review some of the history that got us to this point. And that's led me to listen to people, you know, even such as Alex Jones, which I don't really. Um, listen to as much anymore but I as some of 
as far as some of the modern conspiracy theories, like even 9-11, I think, you know, as you guys say, 40 to 50 percent of people might believe the information is being withheld. I think that's, you know, largely based upon, you know, science, scientific facts and things and evidence that architects and engineers are presenting. As far as, you know, the free fall speed of the buildings that fell, um, mainly Building 7, which collapsed at 530 in the afternoon, which really wasn't widely reported. Um, and as far as your chemtrail topic, uh, you know, some people believe that's conspiracy, but, you know, I've even watched uh, live broadcasts on uh, NBC of a Grand Prix in China where they were having um, a very bad uh, uh, fog, you know, from pollution, and they asked everybody to stay inside for two days while they sprayed to uh, create uh, rain you know, to get rid of some of this uh, pollution fog. Uh, Nick, 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 do you have a question? Well, you know, my question is, if, if, if I was to ask one question, is, you know, as far as uh, you guys, do you really look into, like, some of the science, like, say, even based upon the 9-11 conspiracy, do you feel that there is basic scientific evidence as far as, uh, controlled demolitions are concerned that would lead you to believe that there's a lot more going on than just planes hitting these buildings. Okay, got it. Thanks, uh, Nick. Well, I um, I think the data are pretty conclusive on that. That um, I mean, one of one of the wilder conspiracy theories is that the planes were actually a hologram. Uh, if you yeah. don't believe me that that theory exists, just go on YouTube and you can see people are convinced that the planes were actually an illusion. Uh, that the buildings were actually detonated. Um, people have been looking into that, and just, you know, some very smart people have looked at this, and they, you know, it's, it, it's a tragedy. It's uh, of immense proportions, and, but this is a good example of what you mentioned, Don, earlier. Is, I mean, it's a tragic event, and it was, at some level, fairly simple. The planes flew into the building, and the blue, uh, planes exploded, and the buildings fell. I mean, uh, I don't... Uh, um, that's a fairly uh, straightforward explanation that's true, and, and that's a case where we don't, we don't need more complicated explanations. Yeah. We have uh, a tweet from Derek who says, uh, is there a geographic variance in where these theories originate or perpetuate large cities versus rural areas? That's a great question. I was actually thinking about that this morning. Um, to make a long story short, our lab has been um, collecting written protocols, people describing the 9-11 attacks and the apprehension of um, Osama bin Laden. And these protocols, of course, are completely anonymous, but we have a, a ton of demographic data on these individuals, uh, including the political police and also the general geographic area that they're in. We don't, we don't have a, um, their GPS coordinates, but we know what state they live in, and that's one of the hypotheses we're going to be testing. Mm-hmm. I myself would be surprised if there's any relationship uh, between conspiracy theories and, and location. I think it's, the, the theories may be different, but the, in terms of the statistical uh, likelihood uh, based on geography, I, I doubt it. But we'll look at the data. Well, our, our time is winding down. Uh, is there anything about your research and your studies of all of this that we haven't mentioned that uh, – that you think should be part of this discussion? Well, I should mention that um, uh, we, are, we are analyzing the data from our own lab. Um, I'm, a, I'm a social psychologist with an interest in political dynamics. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is how this can polarize the left from the right and vice versa. Um, and I think conspiracy theories, uh, that's somewhat overlooked in, in the research in this, in this area, that the polarization between the left and the right is a function in part on the use of conspiracy theories as a type of tool. As mm-hmm. a sec- uh, I don't mean as, um, in a nefarious sense, but people use these theories as a way of, of, of further dividing themselves between the right and the left, and, and I'm interested in how that plays out. Well, let us know what you find out about that. This is a time when we certainly want to know if there is that kind of a connection. Absolutely. I want to thank you, Professor Alan Lambert of Washington University, for being with us. He's the Associate Professor of Psychology there. He's just described what his portfolio is. Uh, Again, we appreciate your being here. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.